Hello and welcome to this lecture entitled Access, Use, and Reference. Let's begin by defining access, which Hunter defines as the authority to obtain information from or perform research using archival materials. There are some traditions in United States archival theory that influence the right to use documents. One of these is the historic manuscripts tradition. This tradition assumes that all collections are private and that the gift agreement can restrict access. The Library of Congress, for example, allows donors to approve any access to documents because they consider these to be historic manuscript collections rather than public records. In 2005, for example, the author William Rusher allowed Republican staff members of Congress to access his papers during the Samuel Alito hearings for Supreme Court justice, but he did not allow Democratic staffers that same kind of access, which seems a little skewed, but according to the rules of the historic manuscript tradition and the Library of Congress, were acceptable. The other is the public archives tradition. This assumes that the public owns all of the records and assumes democracy does not exist when public records are restricted except in some cases such as national security. And both of these traditions grew from the French Revolution. Access has a body of ethics associated with it and some of the concepts that are ethical considerations in access theory is the idea of equal access. Equal access means that every researcher can gain access to the materials or at least they can access the information in the materials. This indicates that there should be no discrimination because of a researcher's agenda. Now there can be limits to access to materials if uh, collections are restricted or if the researcher poses a threat to the collection. If there's a threat to the collection, you might be able to provide access to the information in a copied form. Another of these ethics of access is the idea of full access. Archivists are obliged to help researchers find all of the necessary materials. Now this may seem commonsensical and a no-brainer, but there have been issues of archivists researching in their own materials and guarding those materials from access by other researchers who are working on the same topics. This requires archivists to have good knowledge of the collections. Full access means good knowledge. And it requires archivists to work with researchers to ferret out the research that the researcher is really doing. Researcher may come in with some kind of idea, but the archivist can help them hone that idea. And because of full access doctrine, then the archivist is obliged to do that. There are competing rights as well that the ethics of access has to address. One of these is the right to know which is open access to information readily available versus the right to privacy, which in some cases is the right to be left alone. And it's sometimes right to privacy is protected specifically in federal law. For example, FERPA, the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act, also known as the Buckley Amendment from the 1970s, protects school records and protects adult students, adult meaning anybody over 18, from unauthorized personnel, including parents, from accessing student records without explicit permission. Another more recent is HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996 that restricts medical information and medical records uh, unless there is an express permission for access provided by the patient. There are restrictions on access, particularly in the historic manuscript tradition. Sometimes access is completely closed and the collection or an individual item or an individual file might be sealed. When something is closed or sealed, this means that no one, not even staff, can see the thing that is sealed. This begs the question then, 
Why keep it unless there's some kind of legal requirement to keep it? If you can never access it, why should you waste your time and effort keeping it unless there is a legal requirement to keep it? And this is an, a question that an archivist has to deal with. Sometimes a collection might be partially closed or restricted due to contents. There might be legal reasons for closing some or all of a collection to the general public, for example, national security or privacy issues. There are also donor-imposed restrictions. These are usually limited in time, and sometimes the donor is willing to allow individually approved access, and that's fairly frequent. Archivists want these restrictions to be as short as possible and as light as possible while still protecting the relationship with the donor and the rights of the donor or the creator of the records. Preservation stands in contrast to access also. The, if you want to try to preserve something, you really shouldn't allow anybody to handle it ever. But to provide access, you have to have this balancing act between correct preservation and substantial access. And this can be problematic with heavily used collections. Handling harms the material. It can shorten the material's lives. In fact, there are some records that are simply too fragile to handle. Old newspapers are a good example of this, as are letters that have been folded so much that they have tears in them. Maybe there needs to be some conservation work on the documents, or the documents need to be reformatted, which is the archival word for copy the thing. Let people get access to the information, if not the actual document itself. Let's talk now about use. Use is slightly different from access, at least in theory. It has to do often with copying or publishing the information from material in a collection. Now, when we talk about use and when you provide use to patrons, there are some things that you have to consider. The first of these is, of course, copyright. First of all, Everybody freaks out about copyright. Everybody hears about these sensational cases of copyright infringement in which multi-million dollar lawsuits ensue. You are not going to be sued for multi-million dollars. You just don't have that much money. However, you should understand that copyright is a granting of a monopoly on the use of the information as fixed whether it's words or images, to a medium, okay? When words are put onto a page, when images are put onto film, and you can put film and page in quotation marks considering digital documents and digital images, the act of fixing these things creates a copyright. Copyright then really concerns unauthorized duplication. The key is unauthorized. So how do you get authorization? Well, one way, of course, is to contact the actual creator or the owner of the material and get them to give you the right of reprint. That's the simplest way to deal with it. Now, frequently, however, that's burdensome. And it's, it's often unnecessary. And here are some situations when finding a copyright owner is unnecessary. When you're going to make what's called fair use of the copywritten material, fair use is a doctrine in the copyright law that indicates that small components of the material can be copied for academic reasons, for educational reasons, if proper attribution is given. Now, when someone quotes a source, in a book or an article, whether it's online or published in an academic journal or published in a, a popular magazine or anything like that, then if they give credit and the length of the passage is a hundred words or less, that's not rock solid, but that's the rule of thumb, a hundred words or less, then that's considered to be within the fair use doctrine. And so the owner of that quotation or his or her heirs or assigns cannot come after the author and try to squeeze them for some dough. 
Another one of these alternatives to securing explicit copyright is when an article passes into the public domain. Now this changes a little bit and there are various websites uh, from legal experts or from schools of law, particularly Cornell, that deal with the various ways that a previously published document can go into the public domain. That is basically that copyright expires and because of changes in the law over time some documents are covered by one set of guidelines and other documents are covered by other sets of guidelines so it's a good idea to try to find a reasonably accurate and reliable source to tell you when a document can be used this may not pertain to anything that you're holding in your archives because of the way that ownership transfers within the archives, but particularly if you happen to be a researcher or if you are advising someone about research, particularly in published material, you want to know if something has gone into the public domain. Another of these, like I said, is the expiration of copyright. Copyright applies for a limited amount of time, even if that limit is being expanded as time goes on. Nevertheless, there's a point at which copyright expires unless the owner or their heirs and assigns have re-executed the copyright. Otherwise, the copyright actually expires and the document goes into the public domain. Now, the expiration of copyright and the right to re-establish copyright and some of the issues that you will run into when you're dealing with collections is trying to trace who owns the copyright. Let me give you a quick example. If your collection that to which you are giving access and to which you are allowing someone to copy contains correspondence to the person that created the collection, the person that created the collection does not have the right to give copyright to the archives. The person who fixed the words on the medium in the correspondence is the owner of the copyright and has not transferred their copyright to the owner of the collection merely by giving them a letter. Clear as mud? Let me put it to you this way. Just because someone has received letters or emails does not mean that when they give it to your archives that they can transfer copyright. They can only transfer the copyright they own. They do not own the copyright of the letters or cards or other materials that they have received that were created by someone else. Yeah, this gets pretty murky, and it's uh, even talking about it is overstating it a little bit much. But nevertheless, these are things that the ethical archivist needs to consider, particularly when we're talking about use. Now, again, there might be or might not be donor restrictions on access, but there might be donor restrictions on use. Now, these are similar to restrictions on access, and of course, the archivist always wants to limit the number of restrictions and the length of the restrictions and the onerousness of the restrictions, but they still must abide by restrictions that they have allowed to come in. Sometimes a donor will want to control access to the material. Sometimes they don't care and will want to control use of the material, which really means reproduction. These have a wide variety of restrictions, uh, from, from least onerous to, to most onerous. One of these restrictions might be that the donor and owner of the copyright requires a credit line. Now, frequently, the archives itself will ask for a credit line when something is being reproduced, but sometimes, very rarely, the donor of the collection might ask for a credit line as well. Another type of restriction, which is in the world of use restrictions, relatively common, is that use requires the archivist's permission. That is, if someone says, I want to copy this, the archivist decides. They act as the agent of the donor. A more restrictive covenant would be that 
it requires the donor's permission to copy. This means that if a person wants to copy something, either the archivist or the the researcher has to contact the donor and get some kind of express permission to do that. And then there are occasions in which a donor completely restricts the use beyond fair use of the collection. Let me give you a real quick example of that. I received a collection from a local donor of his aunt's short stories in draft form. And this guy had the wherewithal and, and eventually decided he wanted to publish these short stories, at least for local consumption. So before he published those stories, but after he had given the collection to the Wiregrass Archives, he asked that no one be allowed to copy any of these stories. That restriction expired when he published his version of these stories. Let's talk now about making copies and how you, as the archivist, can help with use and making copies. We'll also pick this back up when we talk about reference in just a moment. One way that you can provide service to the researcher is by photocopying. A question to ask is, does the staff do the photocopying or is the photocopying self-service? We also know that scanning is beginning to replace photocopies. The advantage of scanning is that when light passes over the face of the document or the face of the photograph, if it harms that photograph just a little bit or harms that document just a little bit, a photocopy generally makes only one copy per pass of the light beam. And so every time you need a copy, you have to pass the light beam over the document or photograph. But with scanning, you can pass the light beam over it once and make multiple copies from the reserved digitized copy. Disadvantage is it's slower than photocopying in that you have to reserve that file before you can make a copy. And then you frequently have to index that file in one way or another. This is another one in which you have the question of whether it's staff provided or self-service. And then we have to ask about digital photography. Many repositories are now allowing self-service digital photography. And I myself have digitally photographed many documents. If I have to run into an archives very quickly and don't really have time to have them copy it for me and just need a quick reference copy instead of something that's uh, very nice. Let's talk now about reference. What is archival reference? Archival reference is the act by which the archivist guides patrons and researchers to the information they need to answer their questions while retaining security over the collections. The duties of a reference archivist or an archivist providing reference are to provide information about or from the collections, and we'll talk about each of these in a moment to assist the patron in the research visit, and to provide or assist in making duplicates. Let's talk now about providing information. There are two things to think about when you're providing information in a reference visit. One is you're providing information about the collections. Usually this is found in the finding aids. Sometimes these are paper finding aids, hard copies. Sometimes these are online or other uh, digitized finding aid and any kind of metadata record like an EAD record that's online, like a MARC record that is in a searchable catalog, or like a Dublin Core record which is online as well. These are providing information about the collection. This is what archivists do as archivists. We provide information about the collection. Now, a reference archivist in particular is adept at providing information from the collection. This is what an archivist does as a researcher or as a historian. 
the knowledge that an archivist gains from processing, arranging, and describing the collections or from researching in their own collections is how they form their knowledge base about the kind of information, the kind of topics, the kind of data that is inside the collection itself that you can help the patron by guiding them to collections that aren't readily noticeable by them. And now we've talked about the researcher. Who is the researcher? Well, there are two types of researchers, generally speaking, who use archives. And one of these is the researcher of the interpretation. Now, this is the traditional vision of the scholar who is using an archives. They are a minority, always have been a minority in the archival world. What they want is a broad range of material. They're looking for a lot of data that they can then interpret and use for evidence in an, a larger argument that they're making. A lot of times this is some form of historian. They may not be exactly a historian, but they are doing something with the history of topic X. Their goal is to interpret the facts that they find in the data. Now, another type of researcher is the researcher of the fact. They have always been a majority of archival users, but until recently, the archival world didn't really recognize them. They are looking for a smoking gun piece of data to answer a specific question. And you'll see this a lot in local historians who are looking for a little piece of information to fill in a broader story, or, or you'll find them in genealogy groups, and they're looking for a little piece of information here and a little piece of information there. They're not ready to interpret yet. They're just filling out pieces of the puzzle. Sometimes that's all they want to do. And so their research questions to you will be different. It's just part of doing good reference work. One of the ways of dealing with it is to have effective reference and research visits. And we're talking here specifically about a person who appears at your doorway and how do you deal with them when they want access to your collections. Okay, the purpose here is to blend your knowledge of the repository and its collections with the needs of these researchers. And the tools for making that work are the reference interview, some reference room activities, and an exit interview. Okay, so the reference interview is conducted by you when the patron first visits the repository. What are some items to consider? You need to determine the researcher's need and their level of expertise. You seek permission from them to share their identity with others who are looking at similar topics and using similar collections. You explain the repository's rules and any quaint local practices that the repository might engage in so that the researcher understands the limits of the actions that they can take. If there are any fees, you explain them up front in the reference interview. For the reference room activities, here's how it goes. The researcher checks in. They identify themselves. They get a badge, if that's how your repository deals with it, or they get an ID card. They check their bags, their coats, their notebooks. Do not take any of this into the reading room itself. After the reference interview, the researcher then begins consulting finding aids. They then make out call slips based on the files or boxes from the particular collections that they would like to see. The archivist retrieves the appropriate collections or parts of collections, and the archivist tends the reading room. That is, the archivist watches these people. You don't loom over them, but you make your presence known, partly to help them so that they're not sitting around waiting on somebody to come and, and grab the next little batch of material, or they get lost in what they're doing and don't really understand simple things things like where the restrooms are. You're there to help them, but you're also there to make your presence known and to stop any pilfering or damage to the collections as much as possible. 
after the researcher is finished with the material they're using, whether it's at the end of the day or they're ready to switch collections, they return the records they are using to the archivist and eventually the researcher will leave the reading room. Sometimes quaint local practices, they are required to check out other times not, they go back and they fetch their coats, their purses, their computers, and all of that. Sometimes, and this is not very frequent, but if you have an opportunity, it's often good to conduct an exit interview with a researcher. This is an opportunity for you, the archivist, to discover how the user used your repository and collections and how they reacted to the repository and collections. Some of the questions to ask are, did the finding aids assist the user? Did the staff assist the user both adequately? Were the collections useful? And does the user know of any related collections somewhere else? Well, as always, this is the end of the lecture, and I certainly